hello, good morning, good evening, and welcome to the On The Whistle podcast. My name is Alistair Howarth, and I am joined by our resident CAF football expert. I'm talking about the only one on this podcast who has been there and done it in the CAF Champions League, seeking out, you know, maybe we'll do another podcast reminiscing about your glory days with Manning Rangers and your Continental Ventures, Courtney. But Courtney Freeze, how are you doing, brother? Alistair, I'm on top of it. I'm dangerously good, my man. <laughs> That's what I love to hear, Courtney. That's what I love to hear. None of this. Uh, we're struggling. It's tight. It's difficult. I, I want that positivity on the on this podcast. And we need that positivity, Courtney, because we're talking about some football that has perhaps been less positive. I'm, of course, talking about the first leg of the CAF Champions League final, which ended uh, as the most predictable result as we could have ever predicted, which is nil-nil. Courtney, I'm going to throw a stat at you. Coming into this final, we, we had two... African giants, obviously, you know, we, we covered the semifinals about how al beat TP Mazembe, how Mama Lovely Sundance crashed out again at home to a North Africans, which set up this brilliant final between Esperance and, and al And coming into the final, al or Esperance had played 10 matches, nine clean sheets, had only conceded in one game in the group stage and a 3-1 loss to Al-Hilal. al 10 games, nine clean sheets, had only conceded one goal in a 1-1 draw with Yanga in the group stage. So tell me, was there ever, ever going to be a result that wasn't nil-nil in this first leg of the final? Well, well, the results say that, but I'll say <laughs> that to you. That's not what the play on the day said. Um, the play on the day went exactly how I thought it would be. Uh, it would be tactical, aerially dominant, uh, Esperance trying to get the edge uh, in attack. Um, in let's and let's go back and also give credit to the support. There were so much more supporters in the stadium. Finally, we have uh, a support that uh, symbolizes the 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 uh, occasion. So um, I I thought the game would be exactly the way it was. I think um, I actually were lucky to get out of there with a no a no no really. Uh, Esperance were the team on the front foot, very forceful. Um, I cannot see it staying like that in the next leg. It, it won't be. It won't. They will. Well, we all know there has to be a result, but I'll say this to you. I don't know if Esperance, uh, El Atli will be able to break down Esperance. I don't think they will be able to. Yeah, Courtney, I think that's, that, that is, I mean, you, you, you are very confident with Esperance coming into this. And, and I all, think you're, bad, you're Absolutely. You're yeah, and, and I think you're bang on in terms of they're such a physical, such a dominant side. I mean, you think of that back four, you know, experienced, experienced back four with players like Meria, Tugai, Ben Hamida, you know, like, and, and then we've talked about Amanala Memiche, who's been brilliant in goal. I think he's only 20, one of the most exciting goalkeepers on the continent. Uh, but I think a lot of people, might, you know, perhaps myself included, would have thought that al would be a bit more dominant. You know, I think back to last season, when they played Esperance in the semifinal and they thrashed them 3-0 in, in Tunis. But yeah, like you say, it, it really was an Esperance-dominated game and, and you saw the kind of quality they have, especially getting it out wide. And, and, and you know, I think of that uh, Rodriguez chance, the Brazilian center forward, when they had that cross in the first half and they had her glance just wide. Um, whereas on the other hand, al really struggled to create anything of note. I think, you know, the closest they came were a few uh, El Shahat shots from outside the box. You know, there, there didn't seem to be much much creativity um but and i also really want to touch on that point about about the fans i mean courtney what a what a joy it is to see african football stadiums well, packed yes the occasion deserves it the occasion deserves it this is this is not a league fixture this is the champions league final and uh this is what you want to see you want to have this type of appetite for this type of game um as i said it was a nil nil but it was an exciting nil-nil from, from an Esperance uh, point of view. al Ashley were, uh, they created a few chances, but nothing I feel that would really have troubled uh, Esperance. Al um, Esperance just looked physically dominant, ready for this game, uh, did most of the hard running. Uh, they just looked more confident. If they in any way pitch up like that into the next leg, I can't see them not getting a goal. I've been back in this team since early on in the tournament when I've just looked at their physical prowess and how they've been 
um, steamrolling teams moving forward. I knew Sundowns wouldn't be able to deal with them because not because Sundowns aren't good enough. Esperance just got to Sundowns at the wrong period in their season. Yeah, and- for me, Sundowns were cooked. They, they they weren't really they weren't at the right temperature to play Esperance. Yeah, and and we we've kind of gone over many times the kind of Sundowns deficiencies when it comes to this stage in the yes, competition, yes, particularly yes. against teams like Esperance. You know, against teams, your Sundowns. I think for a while have actually had it over Alakli. Sundowns are you know have kind of had Alakli's number. Yes. Uh, in, in you know Alakli, I think with this game, uh, if if I'm not wrong, I, I kind of went back and counted after hearing Maher Mazahi quote this uh, quote the stat. But this is their twenty. This was their twenty first game unbeaten in the CAF Champions League, which is ludicrous. And I think is a record-breaking statistic. No team has gone it's an unbelievable so record games. to have. Yeah. In, in, anyway, it really football. is. Whether you play Sunday League football, whether you play over 45s, uh, Saturday <laughs> football, whatever. If you got a lead, you you got a run or a streak like that, that's an unbelievable streak. You know, you've got to respect it, especially now it's at the top end of the game. Precisely, and and I think particularly in an African context, because you think about some of the away games I likely have had in that run. You know, they've they've gone they've gone down to Pretoria, they've gone to Tunis, they've gone to Casablanca twice. I think they thro- you know beat, beaten uh, Raja got a draw with Widad away from home. So you know this isn't this isn't a league unbeaten run. No offense to Mamelodi Sundowns, we're now one game away from having an invisible season, which is an incredible achievement in itself. But these are huge, huge games. Um, and and and, I like and another stat I want to throw at you because you are very confident in Esperance. I think you know we'll get onto predictions coming into the final, but uh, I think Al Ahli's home form in particular speaks for itself. You know, again, I was going back through the numbers, and I think Al Ahli have won their last fifteen uh, home mat- knockout matches in the CAF Champions League, which is absurd. And they ha- and to go back to uh, an Al Ahli loss in Egypt at home in the CAF Champions League, you have to go back to all the way to 2007 when Etoile du Sahal, uh, uh, Esperanza's rivals in, in Tunisia, went to al Ahly and beat them. I mean, that is ludicrous, Courtney. That is, that is 17 years of yeah, well, knockout let me football. Say this, well, let me say this to you, Alistair. Okay? If I'm the manager of the team, I've got an analyst like you somewhere in the team. Somewhere. You're going to bring me that statistic. That's going to be extra fuel for us to win this game. Gentlemen, have a look at this. This is what is facing us. We're not just in the second leg, final game of the Champions League final. We also have the opportunity to break a record and become heroes like no other team has become in 17 years. Now let's take our chisels out and chisel our name into into the history books here by not just winning this tournament, but also by breaking this record. So, listen, you, you don't need to say more than that because the, the players could play today, they could play tomorrow, they could play next week. The players are ready to play. It's about saying the right thing to just give them that impetus to go out there and absolutely steamroll our athlete. Uh, I wouldn't say they're the best team at this point in time, but I would say they're the wrong team to face Al Ashley. They're just the wrong team. Yeah, and I think, yeah, like you say, Esperance have shown themselves to be a really good knockout team. Um, but I, I also want to th- throw it, you know, we were talking about the, the kind of significance of home games in a fans. And look, a lot of us, you know, maybe we'll, we'd include ourselves in this, are, are kind of bored of, of Al Ahly's dominance. You know, they've been cleaning up titles in the, in the CAF Champions League since really since Pizzo Masimane took over. You know, they've won, I think, three of the last four. And the fourth one that they didn't win was obviously that very controversial one when they lost. Uh, against Widad when it was at a neutral venue in Casablanca. Yes. Uh, but significantly, if Al Ahly w- go on to win uh, this this game on Saturday, I think 5 p.m. GMT, it will be the first time that Al Ahly have won in front of a home crowd since 2013. Because we have to remember that since COVID, as well as along with the restrictions on fans in Egypt, we have not been seeing Al Ahly fans in numbers. So despite this being probably their most dominant kind of era in African football, which is saying a lot considering it's Al Ahly, uh, their fans haven't really been a part of that journey. And we saw, and we'll, we'll probably, we'll get onto this uh, in the Confederation Cup final, what it meant to the Zamilek fans, because Zamilek obviously beat Arsberg Khan on Sunday at home. 
and you saw the kind of energy and passion of a you know Cairo International Stadium that was kind of almost entirely full the away end wasn't but you know 64,000 plus fans kind of the energy there and you know you're talking about how brilliant it was in Esperance I implore you who are watching and listening to this go back and look at some of the images as well some of the choreography some pro-Palestinian choreographies from the Esperance fans it's incredible uh, we saw again with Zamelik on, on Sunday some anime inspired choreography and so, you know, we're expecting to see something just as big, if not better, from, from al Ahly fans. And so that is so special for us to kind of see whether or not they win, but to, you know, see these huge clubs with this massive history behind them to actually be able to have play in front of their fans. I think that's really significant going Absolutely. going into the final because al Ahly haven't been, you know, like I said, they haven't been able to play in front of their fans for for years. So I think that will be that will be special Courtney I, I want to just kind of zone in on one on one player in particular kind of bringing your South African expertise because last season in the knockout Percy Tau was excellent you know we saw the very best of him his running his movement his directness this season he's been pretty good in the league he really struggled at the AFCON obviously missing a penalty missed some really big chances in a very successful South African side that obviously went to the semi-finals and he's kind of not really been at it for al -Akhli since he's come back from the AFCON. Okay. What, what's, what's going on? I like the way you are... Listen, you can definitely go into journalism. I, I'll tell you that now because you, 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 you sugarcoat bad situations. He was terrible at the AFCON. <laughs> he was terrible. You know, if I'm the manager, I, I'm not even starting him. I was getting nothing out of him. Him and Tebo Homokwen. Absolutely, I didn't think they were... Hey, hey, hey. I will hear a bad word about Tebo Homokwen as an Afghan, okay? <laughs> it's, it's, it just was not good. And uh, listen, players go through this. This happens with your form and this is what professionalism is about. You go through these dips. You know, I remember I, I was actually listening to a documentary the other day before Euro 96, and I don't think you were even born then, Ali. Um before Euro 96, Alan Shearer hadn't scored for England for two years. For two years, way into the tournament. Absolutely nothing. Gets to the tournament as on fire. So players go through this, okay? So, I, listen, he's going through a difficult moment. He, he His quality is there. He, he will ignite himself again. But during this period, his form is just not good. Yeah, and, and it's kind of ironic because at the same time where he's been in contract negotiations, which always seems to be a thing that it's the distractions off the pitch that often inform how players play play on the pitch. Because I think I think I'm not sure if the comfort if the contract has gone through, but if it does go through, he'll be the highest paid uh, footballer in, in in Africa. And look, Percy Tau is a brilliant footballer, and on his day, you know, we've seen it. Whether it was against Al Ahly when he was at uh, at Sundowns or at his during his time at Al Ahly, he he really can be brilliant. And now, now Courtney, uh, kind of going into the second leg, you know, you've talked about how dominant Esperance were at home. Obviously, things are going to be very different when it's in Egypt. Al Ahly are going to be at home. They're going to have, you know, we saw that in that in the uh, quarter or semifinals against TP Mazembe away from home. They were struggling. Mazembe had lots of chances. They kept a nil nil. And then they thrashed them 3 0 at home. Obviously, Mazembe had a goal disallowed for VAR, and things could have been different if that was allowed. But, and then coming into this game, Al Ahly already have quite a few injuries. Ali Malul, who's probably been the most consistent player on the continent, the Tunisian left back, obviously got two assists against Mazembe, has been brilliant for Al Ahly. He came off injured. I think he's an Achilles injury. He'll miss the final. But they have Ali Ujian coming back into the mid midfield strong athletic Malian midfielder who's been one of the most consistent players on the continent how do you see this second leg going you know are we going to see that same kind of dominance from Esperance or is it going to be kind of a backs to the wall performance similar I guess to what they did against in, against Sundowns in, in Pretoria you've got two teams here Alistair and the two teams play very different football Esperance as I said is physically dominant set pieces are a massive thing for them al Ashley are basically, they, they like to pride themselves as the ball-playing team within Africa. So, if you are the manager for Esperance, you go out there and play ugly football. You, you create, a, you create a, a divisive system that doesn't allow them to play football. You have lots of free kicks, lots of aerial uh, opportunities. This is what you create. You make them do what they don't like doing. That is defense, defend aerially, uh, set up for long balls, throw-ins, free kicks, corners. This is what they don't want to do. They want a team to put the ball down. 
if they were playing Sundowns, I would say to you now, they beat Sundowns comfortably because it'll be a lovely game. Mokwena wants to play this lovely football fish pattern, knock it, keep it, knock it, keep it until the people fall over after passing it. No, you don't need to do that. This is a one-off game. This is a shootout, right? This is the 100-meter sprint. You at the line. You get yourself to the end the best way you know. And all Esperance will do, if I, if I can see how they started the last game, just go tactically. Beat them with ugly football. At the end of the day, your name's on the trophy. You've broken a record that no one else has broken. No one else is going to write. Well, they played terrible football, and most of it was kick and run, uh, but their name is on the trophy. No one liked how they played. No one's going to write that. No one's going to care about that. We're going to have a podcast and say they won. Courtney, you called it from early on in the tournament. Their football wasn't great, and they beat a team who played wonderful football, who have an unbeatable home record for over 17 years. The accolades will go to them. I, I can't see Al Ahli putting a glove on them. Wow. Courtney Freeze, that is a that is a bold bold take. And I'm, I'm gonna have to ask you to be a bit more specific, Courtney. I want I want a prediction. What is the result gonna be One on nil. that match? One nil, One job nil. done. And, and and you you guys know it. You guys know it. You know, you may not know this here because this is how Arsenal used to win in in the nineties when you weren't around. <laughs> there even is a song, it's called One Nil to the Arsenal. It's one nil scrappy goal. I, I can even tell you it'll be a scrappy goal. And then they'll just defend well. And I actually will be doing all of what they can and not being able to get through. It, I, I, can, I can't see it being anything else but that based on what I watched in the first game. Yeah, and it's kind of for, for, verbatim, essentially, what it felt like they did against Sundowns, kind of get yeah. there, get the goal, do the job. Um, now, I, and obviously with the away goals rule, you know, I'll actually want to try and dominate. They want to try and press. But if Esperance got one goal, you know, suddenly I'll actually have to score two um, I think for me personally, I, I, I don't want to say, I don't want to say, I don't want to go through this. I don't want to say I called the Sundowns <laughs> semi-final games, both one. I, I don't want to say that, you know, I don't want to sound like, you know, like a, a few days ago, the England uh, national team got picked for the Euros. I don't want to say that I called Curtis Jones will be in the team. I don't want to say that. And, and let me tell let me tell viewers and listeners, this is the same humble Courtney who continues, who, who's never once reminded us that he predicted Morocco would go to the semifinals. Of the World I don't want to tell people that. He, he, does, he, doesn't, he doesn't tell us that. I don't, want, <laughs> I don't want people to remember those things. I want people to say, that guy's talking nonsense. He's got no track record of what he's saying. But I, it, it, it's how it's going to turn out. We'll be talking next week and he'll say, oh, but Courtney, I'm sure I heard someone say that. Said, well, I'm sure someone said it. <laughs> Courtney, I love I love the confidence. Well, I, I, we will be bringing back this clip next week, whether you're right oh, or wrong. We'll be bringing oh, it back. Oh, I, I, I hope as, it works out for me. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> suddenly, suddenly, Courtney's sweating. He's stressing. Oh I think no. From from my end, I think. Look, I think I think in many ways you're right. I think Esperanza is the antidote to to Al Ahly, in, as they have been to Sundowns. But for me, you know, those kind of stats that we're thinking about, you know, 15 matches, one at home in knockout matches, 21 games unbeaten. I think for me, it's the reverse for me. I think it's it's going to be low scoring, 1-0, uh, luckily. Uh, I, I think that's going to be the job done. Now, now, Courtney, we want to quickly move on to another job done, 1-0 win in Cairo that happened last week. And that's, of course, the Confederation Cup, which Samelik beat. RS Burkane, because for those of you who don't know, who, who may have watched it on the TV, but uh, didn't see what happened afterwards, Samelik, lovely goal from Hamdi, assist from Zizo, 1-0, job done, beating Burkane. Uh, but it was after the match that things kicked off. Uh, so first of all, we have uh, three Burkane players, um, from what I'm told, were seen trying to assault the referee as he went off the pitch. Uh, but we also had... Uh, absolute chaos in Bedlam, obviously 60 plus thousand fans in the stadium. Uh, some fans found their way onto the pitch via the zone area, VIP area in which the Zamelik uh, families were staying. So obviously there's a kind of big breach in security. Uh, as part of that, the, the um, security team were trying to clear up those fans and it's caught on camera, uh, an usher bringing out the trophy and on camera being knocked over by the security who push, who are trying to push out two Zamelik fans. Uh, 
out of the stadium and they actually hit the person on camera. Uh, obviously, it's then delayed by 30 or 45 minutes. The actual trophy presentation, Dr. Patrice Motsepe, the president of CAF, uh, and not the owner of Mamelodi Sundowns, um, came down to present the trophy, but obviously did it almost an hour late because of the delays. Meanwhile, some Samelic board members got their hands on the trophy and started celebrating. And then, uh, and in the meantime, the Samelic fans, our players, go to the fans, pick up some flares, and are, are dancing with flares players, which obviously makes for brilliant images, but I think is against the FIFA rules around what players can and can't do. Um, and then eventually some of the players couldn't get off the pitch because the security were blocking the, the player's tunnel so as to stop fans from getting in there. And some players almost came to blows with security. So all in all, a kind of chaotic night. Um, now it is a bit humorous. Uh, and the atmosphere was absolutely sensational. As I said, again, like it's the same for Zamelik fans. It's been almost five years since they've been able to have a full stadium for a match of this size. And so obviously getting carried away with it sometimes can, can happen. Courtney, you know, what do you make of this? You know, is it kind of playful nonsense kind of that is funny and whatever, or is it actually something a bit more, a bit more serious that we kind of need to take more seriously in the game? Alistair, I don't see it as something playful. You, you must remember football is not, it doesn't belong to certain people. It doesn't belong to youngsters between the ages of 18 and 25. It does not belong to them, okay? Does not. Football belongs to absolutely everyone. Parents with their young boys, young girls, mothers going with young children, elderly people. It belongs to everybody. But now when you start getting this sort of narrative where you get behavior like this in, in the grounds, I'm the first one to say on a, on a chat like this, don't go. Mm -hmm. Don't go. Stay at home. Be safe. Be close to toilets, number two, where there's not anything terrible going on in the stadium as well, where you don't feel intimidated and you don't feel unwelcome. Don't go. Stay at home. Watch the game on TV. This is why people live stream games and all this illegal internet streams happen because people don't want to be part of that. They don't want to be part. They want to watch the games. They want to go to uh, watch their supporters, but they don't want to see that level of hooliganism. It, it's 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 not necessary. I was watching a situation the other day on TV, the Euros uh, final, um, where England versus Croatia, and and. Uh, this man went to his daughter to the ground and the intimidation and the fear. And then you look at these yobs standing on buses, drinking from six o'clock in the morning, taking all types of drugs. Listen, just stay at home. Stay at home. Let there be 12 people in the stadium, six dogs and six men. Let those people rather be there. Nobody deserves that. Nobody deserves that. And if it can't be made safe for people to go and enjoy, don't go. Uh, stay at home. Because imagine you decided, Alistair, that, listen, you're going to take your lovely lady, you're going to go and sit in the crowd. Now, you are a football purist, okay? Your aim is to go there, not just watch the game, but watch the interaction between supporters, what supporters feel the atmosphere, drink the whole cocktail that's being served on a platter. You wouldn't like the taste of that. Well, and I can confirm that because my missus refuses to go to football games with me anymore after she got some friendly abuse from uh, some Charlton fans on a train from Manchester when they noticed that we were wearing our Blackburn Rovers kits. You, know, um, <laughs> you know what, Alyssa? I, I don't understand this. I don't understand it. I, I, I swear to you, it makes no sense. I'm a Liverpool supporter. If I see an Everton person on the way, it would not bother me. Mm. I, I probably would stop and drink with you. I, it does. I don't understand the 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 aggressive patriotism to your club. It, it makes no sense. If you one of those idiots out there that's aggressively patriotic to your team, please send us something. Tell us what is going on in your head so we can send you the necessary medica medication you need, <laughs> so you get help here. Because you shouldn't be providing any sort of intimidation to anyone that's coming to the game just to enjoy it. That's not the point of going to a stadium. I hate the fact that that, that element exists in the stadiums. So forget the racism. Forget the nasty comments. It's just the aggressiveness mm. towards each other. But 
you know, like we go and watch a rugby game. For goodness sake, Alistair, I hate making this example. I go to more rugby games than football games for this exact same reason. Mm. And I think it's, I, I, I think I take a slightly less aggressive stance, but I totally understand where you're coming from. Whereas, you know, I love the aggression of, of a fan in terms of the like intimidation on a pitch. I, I love that. You know, I think particularly, I think of, you know, the women's AFCON actually the final where it's just like, you can't even hear yourself because of the whistles and the, and you the, want that. Yeah. I, I will. I want that. But that's the problem is when people like me want is there's a very fine line between there and the women's AFCON final where it's safe, you know, people, the families are there, but it's that aggressive and kind of intimidating atmosphere. And there's a thin line between that and then what things like you see in Wembley when you have, you know, guys in their early 20s or 30s kind of taking cocaine and doing doing crazy things. Courtney, we're here to talk about the, the CAF Champions League final and, and a, a kind of analyze what's happening on the pitch. And we're, we're out here talking Listen, about, about the, medi- medicating this, football fans. But this, uh, this I love it. It's part of the picture because you must remember in this beautiful game, the advert is to provide safe and enjoyable uh, opportunities for people to go out there and and uh, and and appreciate the, the the dynasty of football. This is what this is the advert. Go out there and enjoy it. Be there with your family. Now mm. I'm here with my 12 year old daughter, and this is going on. No, I don't want to be there. Mm. Absolutely, Co- Courtney. It has been a pleasure. And, and as Courtney says, if if you're listening to this and you're saying, "What are these geezers talking about?" I love doing a bump of cocaine and, and getting really drunk and then going to a football fan and, uh, match and causing some problems. Message us, uh, tweet us on the o- o- OTW underscore podcast, same as Insta on the Whistle podcast on Facebook and YouTube. Tell us why you love that stuff. And and also, I want you guys to also tell us if you think Courtney is off his rocker thinking that Esperance are going to dominate al in, in the final and, uh, and, and that you can't, wait, you can't wait what to... What do to, I know? To hear what he says after. What do once... I know? I, I'm going to tell you one thing, Alyssa, because I'm going to tell you one thing because there, there's people like you out there uh, who may also not know this. For years, I was telling people, Lance Armstrong is a cheat. <laughs> For years. And, and, and Alistair, the amount of arguments we Ooh. got in Lance Armstrong, look what he does for all the... Listen, that's not what I'm saying. Lance Armstrong is cheating. There's no chance. He does so much. He's such a... Listen, Lance Armstrong is cheating. What happened? There you, <laughs> there, there you have it. To finish off, Courtney Freeze, a pleasure as always. Alistair Owen, the Blackburn supporter. Lovely talking to you, sir.